Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eileen Regan. I'm the CCO at Examine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today um, to the third in our male fertility series. So as, as some of you may know, now that we've joined a few, uh, these will take place on a monthly basis. And each month we're joined by an expert in the field of fertility treatment or therapies. Um, and the event is very much open to all. So we have a wide range of participants joining us from academics, healthcare professionals, urologists, gynecologists, and also in the wellness and reflexologists, nutritionists as well. And then of course we have our, our patients, the men, the couples and individuals who are on their own fertility journey. So we would like to welcome you all. You're all very welcome to join us this evening and we hope you enjoy the event. So what I would like to do is introduce you to our speakers. So first of all, our chair, Professor, Professor Sheena Lewis, who is the founder and CEO of Examine and honorary professor of the Russell Group Queen's University here in Belfast, where the, for the past 25 years, she's dedicated her research into novel testing for male infertility. Sheena is currently an executive member of Association of Reproductive and Clinical Scientists and chair of its scientific advisory committee. She has published over 100 full papers and numerous book chapters and reviews. And she's been past chair of the British Andrology Society, UK national representative and chair of the Andrology Special Interest Group of the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology an executive member of the British Fertility Society and was a founder member and vice chair of the Irish Fertility Society. Professor Lewis's research led, her to the, led to the formation of the spin-out company Examine from Queen's University in Belfast, where we market the exact range of male fertility tests powered by the sperm comet technology, which is now the market leader for sperm DNA damage testing in the UK and Ireland. And we'd also then like to welcome our speaker today. Sarah Martins de Silva is the Senior Lecturer in Reproductive Medicine at the University of Dundee and Honorary Consultant Gynecologist. Sarah is a Senior Lecturer in Reproductive Medicine at the University of Dundee and runs a trans translational research program focused around male infertility, sperm biology and drug discovery. And she was recognized for her research in 2019 and named as one of the most inspiring and influential women from the, around the world by the BBC 100 Women. She also was an honorary consultant gynecologist clinical lead for NHS Tayside Infertility Services and the person responsible for the Nine Wells Assisted Conception Unit. As part of her clinic, clinical activities, she runs specialized male infertility clinics as well as a sperm studies research clinic for couples affected by low, no fertilization following IVF or ICSI. So our thanks to Sarah for joining us this evening. Um, and just before I hand over to the speakers, I just want to run you through some of the housekeeping. So we'll have a welcome and introduction from Professor Lewis, then we'll hand over to, to Sarah for the, for the main event. And then we'll finish with the last 15, 20 minutes um, with a question and answer um, with our speaker and with Professor Lewis. So please um, pose your questions throughout the talks using the Q&A panel, um, not the chat function. So use the Q&A uh, for the questions. And then you'll also have the opportunity to rate questions. So if there's anything um, that keeps coming up, you know, keep give it a like and we'll make sure that that question gets answered for you today. Um, if you do experience any technical issues, use the chat and I'll do my very best to help you if I can. Um, just to let you know, attendees will be muted throughout and the video, videos are enabled for our speakers only. Um, all the events in the series are recorded and will be made available on the Examine Events webpage um, following each session. So allow us 24 to 48 hours to get that recording up for you. Um, and one CPD point will be awarded for the attendees for the one hour event and a certificate will be circulated um, again within 24 to 48 hours of the event. Um, and at the end of the session, you will be invited to rate it. So all feedback is obviously welcome um, and any suggestions for how we can improve future sessions as well. But so without further ado, um, I will now hand over to our chair, uh, Professor Lewis, to start the session. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to, uh, to attend. And I'm glad the football will be on later. We'll be well finished by eight o'clock. So you'll be able to actually relax and enjoy yourself by that stage. 
So as you've heard tonight, um, we're going to talk about bale fertilization and we're going to get some really new information, things that I certainly haven't heard before. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what um, Sarah has to, to say to us. Before we go on to Sarah's talk, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about our company. Um, the company is called Examine and our mission and our vision is to raise awareness of male infertility. I've been around for quite some time, as you, as you can see. And I, when I started, um, no one even knew what the word andrology was. And certainly talking about male fertility or infertility 25 years ago was an absolute taboo subject. It was about as welcome as talking about um, a dead snail at a dinner party. So we wanted to, to tell people uh, um, about fertility give them more knowledge, give them, empower them so that they um, would be able to talk with, um, with confidence and without embarrassment about these issues. And to know that there were many other people who were in the same situation as they were. And also we wanted to be able to provide some novel tests because as you all know, the semen analysis is um, it's rather a blunt instrument. It's the WHO um, gold standard and it's absolutely something that we have to do, but there are other things that we ought to do as well. And when we give men the opportunity to see what their sperm quality is like, then they can take control and they can do many things to optimize their sperm health before they go towards treatment. So our, um, our belief is that inadequate testing has led to poor treatment decisions and to poor success for many couples. Um, because when you're looking at the semen analysis, you do three things. You look at the number of sperm a man has, you look at whether or not they can swim, which is great because that gives you a real time shot of whether or not they're healthy. And you look at their morphology, but you don't look at the really important thing, which is the DNA. And of course it's the sperm DNA, which makes a man's children look and act like him. Just a little bit about um, Examen, I won't bore you with all the details, but we've been around for over a decade now. Um, the company was started as a, a university spin out and now we would call it a scale up because we've got rather more um, employees and, and lab space than we had when we started. We have um, got accreditation, first of all, with an ISO 9001 and now with a 13485 and we're working towards um, uh, an in vitro diagnostic accreditation with the EU, which I know you'll think is rather amusing since we just left the EU, but nonetheless, it's something that is still um, the gold standard for us. The exact tests are a little bit different from some of the other um, advanced tests that you can get in that they have been based on over 30 years of non-commercial in uh, university research. And we've published quite a lot of papers. We looked at other tests to see if they would be better than the semen analysis. But when we looked at DNA, everything we threw at it from disease, from diabetes to, um, to oxidative stress, to vasectomies, everything had an impact on DNA quality. And of course, when we looked at DNA quality and how it impacted IVF, then we realized that this was something that every man should have an opportunity to have access to if he wanted. Why come to us? Well, I've mentioned a couple of the things already. The Comet test or the exact test is the only test on the market that can actually quantify the amount of DNA damage per sperm and give you that in a report where you can see how many good sperm a man has, how many poor sperm he has, what the overall um, quality of the, 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 um, the sample is like, and then that can be used to guide uh, clinical treatment. The Comet assay can also measure single and double strand breaks, which is different to, to some of the other tests that are around. And as I said, um, which got a very high quality standard and people tell us that we, we provide a very good service. So exact testing means that men can take back control of their fertility. They can become equal players in their journey. Instead of the whole fertility journey being female focused, men are playing as, uh, as equal players. And, and this, of course, engages them and is much better for the couple. They get a chance to improve their sperm quality. And from a clinic's point of view, they are more likely to remain engaged in their treatment because we know that men become disenfranchised with the process because they're very often treated like uh, second class citizens. We're very glad to report that over the last couple of years, measuring DNA damage has been included in international fertility guidelines. 
It's in the European Association for Urology, and it's also in the ESHRA guidelines. And both of those suggest that the semen analysis, whilst it's the first test a man should have, it's not the last test that he should have. And the DNA testing should also be added to his workup. Tonight, we're going to be talking about failed fertilization. And the whole fertility journey for a couple is very much like a roller coaster. Of course, they want to have a healthy baby. That's, the, that's their primary um, desire. Before that, they want to have an ongoing pregnancy and no miscarriages. Before that, are they going to get pregnant at all? Before that, are they going to have good quality embryos that are going to grow well over the, the three to five day period? Before that, is the woman super ovulating and do they have enough um, embryos? But the one that worries people most from what I, I hear, both in, in the clinic and also from a patient's point of view is, do the eggs get fertilized by the sperm? And if they don't, why not? Now the current solution, like the solution for virtually everything to do with male um, problems is let's do ICSI. Let's do ICSI again. That's the ultimate panacea for every couple. But my question tonight is why? What's the mechanism behind this? What's the scientific rationale behind doing ICSI? And I'm not sure if we know, and I think we're going to hear some answers tonight. Failed fertilization is often due to sperm problems, but if we continue to use the aged instrument of a semen analysis alone, we're never going to find out what sperm anomalies are causing failed fertilization. We absolutely need to do more research. And I think that we have been really neglecting men and um, disadvantaging them by focusing so much of our research on the woman and so little on the man. I'm going to hand over now to, um, to our, our special speaker for this evening. I was looking at her, her CV and some of the, the papers that she had published. And one she published a few years, she had entitled Mission Impossible, Improving ART Outcome Following Unexplained Total Failed Fertilization. Tonight, she's going to tell us a little bit more on whether it's still a mission impossible. I don't believe that is the case. I think considerable progress has been made. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheena. That's a, a great introduction. And thank you to Examen for uh, inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, now, without further ado, I'm going to try and share my screen, which is always a, a moment of, of glory or um, failure, but I'm hoping that's come up as a, as a screen for you all to see. Um, so as you already have heard, I am a senior lecturer in reproductive medicine. So my day job is sort of shared between being a clinician working in an IVF clinic, but also a, a clinical academic and trying to mine and get deeper into understanding sperm and how they work better. So kind of pretty much exactly what Sheena was saying previously, this is a slide that we might uh, see in our clinic of a semen analysis. And a semen analysis is a very quantitative tool. We, we look down the microscope, we count the number of sperm, we assess how they're swimming, we fix some cells and we look at the morphology. And that then gives us a, a diagnosis of, 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 of whether there is an issue on the male side of that couple. And if they move forward then into reproductive technology, you're looking at IVF if the male sample is essentially normal within the WHO recommended uh, ranges, or we look at ICSI if there's a low sperm count, poor sperm swimming, poor uh, normal morphology or a mixture of those. And I've got IUI there obviously in that list. And I think if you're a same sex couple, then obviously this has a place to play. And if you're struggling to have regular unprotected intercourse, I would agree that that also has a, a, a role to play in treatment. But I think the main part of heterosexual couples that have already been trying to get pregnant is split between IVF and ICSI. So the reality is when they come through for IVF ICSI is that not every egg will fertilize. And we see somewhere between sort of 65 and 75% fertilization rate on average in most clinics. But five to 10% of, of couples undertaking IVF and one to 3% of couples undertaking ICSI are affected by total failed fertilization where no eggs are fertilized at all. And similarly, there's another group of patients where they have unexpected low fertilization and quite how you define that. We go with less than 25%, but less than 30% has also been cited. 
So these are uncommon, but clearly devastating problems that halt IVF ICSI treatment in their, in their steps and um, obviously have ma major impact in terms of therefore not progressing the treatment and with no hope of getting pregnant. So why do fertilization issues happen? We try and break it down into lab issues, which might be related to the media, the temperature, pH, equipment malfunction. These are astonishingly rare, but we would always consider that with any case that we see. Think about the female side of that partnership. So the poor stimulation or poor egg maturity or poor egg quality. Perhaps there's obvious issues with the sperm quality. Perhaps it's frozen thawed uh, pre-chemo, for example. But maybe there's a bigger underlying issue with sperm function that we just haven't asked the right questions for before treatment. Or there is another probably large um, sizable group where it's apparently unexplained. There's no obvious reason why this has happened. And it's really this group at the bottom here, those where there potentially is a sperm function issue or those where there is no obvious explanation for a fertilization issue that we are particularly interested in. Now, there's a huge kind of variety of different requirements that a sperm uh, needs to achieve fertilization in vivo but also in vitro um, so there is a lot of different uh, things that a sperm needs to do to to get to the egg but then also to to fertilize the egg and that involves various iron channel um, modulation receptor uh, ligand interactions different um, elements of membrane fusion proteolysis and oocyte activation and we begin now to recognize that there is much more to the sperm's contribution to fertilization and to the embryo than just its DNA. So there are also epigenetics, method, methylation and post-transcriptional histone modifications, uh, mRNA, um, but also proteins that the sperm uh, carries that are required for fertilization and embryo development. And this has been really very eloquently summarized in a, in a recent review paper by Castillo et al. And I'll just draw your attention really to that end stage of oocyte activation. Oh, sorry, gone, gone forward one. Oocyte activation, particularly these two proteins, phospholipase C zeta and PAWP. So what is oocyte activation, I hear you say? Well, oocyte activation is a message that the sperm gives to the egg to tell it it has been fertilized. And what that looks like in real terms is a calcium signal that is uh, from calcium stores released from within the endoplasmic reticulum that, that activates and wakes up that egg to then drive meiosis and then to uh, proceed on to uh, uh, embryogenesis and, and, and cell division and so on. And it was very uh, nicely described to me once upon a time as a Mexican wave. Um, and it, so this at the bottom here is Hamden, obviously a key um, venue tonight for, uh, for the football match that will define whether Scotland's going to go any further in the uh, Euros uh, Cup. So if you imagine this stadium full of people, which obviously is, uh, you know, I'm already stretching your imagination given COVID times, but imagine it full of people, but everyone's completely silent. And then the, the kind of analogy here is the arrival of the sperm would be a football player arrives in the stadium stadium and all of a sudden everything kind of goes crazy and wild and a Mexican wave starts around the around the stadium and so this is the equivalent of the calcium uh, message uh, wave of calcium across the stadium across the egg rather uh, and then that subsequently kind of falls into a pattern of oscillation so up and down and up and down and this is uh, very eloquently described by Saunders et al in 2002 in mouse eggs first of all uh, and subsequently in other species including humans now it's up absolutely up for debate still what absolutely the, the key factor is here but I think most people would agree that it is this message phospholipase C zeta that's the key molecule that the sperm carries into the egg that tells it it's been fertilized and triggers their cells. So onwards from USA activation thinking about fertilization events and thinking about sperm function what else do we know? Well, we know that the way a sperm swims or the amount of sperm present that uh, a motile within a sample correlates both to a couple's chances of getting pregnant, but also to IVF success. And interestingly, talking about calcium oscillations and calcium signals at the time of oocyte activation, kind of a different mechanism, but similar molecule here, calcium within the sperm cell is absolutely fundamental to how it swims and also how it, how it functions. And we know that the levels of calcium in response to certain elements that it sees, particularly progesterone from the, from the egg, relates to IVF fertilization rates. We know that hydrogen ions or its pH acid levels are also critical to sperm swimming and fertility. 
And we also know that within the sperm are calcium stores that contribute to a mechanism of changing the type of swimming to hyperactivated motility, which is part of capacitation, which is part of the function that a sperm needs to acquire before it can fertilize an egg. So in summary, calcium and hydrogen ions are, are critical to determining uh, how a sperm works and how this calcium and iron, um, uh, hydrogen ions get into the cell is primarily determined by ion channels or pores within the sperm membrane. So cat spur is a unique uh, ion channel that was first described a decade ago by a, a group from uh, the States, Lischko et al and Strunker et al, which are a group within Munich. And they both simultaneously published finding this really different, this new ion channel that had never been seen in any cells ever before. And it's only expressed in sperm. It's located along the flagella. And these beautiful pictures that I show here show the racing stripes of this cat spur ion channel. So they're in four domains, four racing stripes down the sperm tail. And it is this that is absolutely critical to how calcium gets into the cell and how, uh, how a sperm functions. Now, it's a really complicated ion channel. It's very difficult to kind of build and there may be other parts of this information that we don't completely understand, but there are four subunits and then there are six further sub subunits and an auxiliary protein called Catspur tau and all of these different elements are required for this Catspur channel to function. And as I say, in response to progesterone or other elements that the uh, sperm would see within the female reproductive tract or as it comes close to the egg, such as pr pr prostaglandins, or in response to a change in pH, then cat spur is activated and this changes how a sperm works. And interestingly, there's been more uh, data published um, onwards from this, looking at endocrine disruptors. So these are various plastics and other things that are within our environment, uh, pollution and so on, that can activate this channel and cause it to dysfunction. So it may well be that because it's got such a sensitive mechanism that's uh, required for fertilization, that there are many other things that men or we are exposed to that cause a problem with cat sperm. K-spur is another ion channel, and this one is responsible for potassium channels to uh, potassium to go into the cell. K-spur and cat-spur interact, so there's an important role. If one doesn't function, the other won't either. Um, and this uh, kind of maintains the, the membrane potential, so it's a negative positive charge across the sperm membrane. And lastly, HV1 is a proton channel. So this is a channel that hydrogen ions can move into the sperm cell. And again, these are just in two stripes down the tail. And you can see on these figures on the, on the right by Miller et al, there's these four kind of green splodges of the cat spur stripe, and then these two pink splodges of, of the HV1 proton channel stripe. So that goes all the way down the tail. And this is responsible for how a sperm kind of uh, swims in a torpedo and in a rotational way. So so what you might say that's very interesting it's interesting molecular biology what does that mean to me as a patient or me as a clinician in, a, in an IVF clinic well we know that when we have looked at these uh, the function of these ion channels in a great deal of detail that these can determine fertility and these aren't things that are normally tested within semen analysis so about uh, seven eight years ago I set up a sperm studies research clinic and the idea was that couples particularly that had been affected by abnormalities in fertilization, those that had no fertilization, so total fertilization failure, or those that had low fertilization, where we had looked and excluded any obvious lab problems, any issues with female age or a number of eggs that might be a, a more plausible explanation on the female side of that equation, to then ask the guys if they would uh, you know, donate our samples to, to look at various elements of, of their uh, sperm in a very different, but a much more detailed, complex way. And we could look at the ion channels, we could look at the calcium stores and the calcium signals from the sperm. We could look at the protein, the phospholipase C to protein, and we could also extract DNA from the guys and, and look at some sort of genetics um, relating to the ion channels and so on particularly. So we now have amassed a case series of 50 couples and 68 cycles of treatment. 34 of those are IVF cycles, of which 23 were no fertilization, and 11 where they had very low fertilization. And you can see the spread of the range there with an average of 13.8% of eggs fertilized. Similarly, 24 ICSI cycles, about half of them affected by no fertilization, and the other half with, again, very low fertilization. And you can see between those two groups, 
uh, there was no significant difference in female age, but overall the female partner's age was 33. So these should be a good prognosis group. And they had a good number of eggs. So on average, nine eggs retrieved, although that ranges from four to 20. And what we then went on to, to publish and show is that iron channel dysfunction is extraordinarily common. Cat's spur dysfunction actually per se is not particularly common. And we have described some sig single case uh, series, uh, sorry, ca ca single cases of, of this, but actually probably about 10% of the guys that we uh, did electrophysiology studies on showed an abnormality in the potassium channel that sets up how cat's spur works. And onwards from that, as I say, we looked at the amount of a PLC zeta or phospholipase C zeta protein within the sperm. Well, you can tag this with a fluorescent antibody. You can measure the amount of fluorescence compared to fertile sperm. And we saw that within a population of, of, of men's cells that a significant proportion of them had issues with this protein expression. Um, so overall, about a third of men had either low or no phospholipase C zeta expression compared to fertile controls. And certainly we've now uh, published to show that um, in collaboration with our Oxford colleagues, that uh, the proportions of phospholipase C to correlate quite um, uh, uh, significantly with fertilization following ICSI. So as I've already said, the lab issues following failed fertilization are uncommon. The egg issues following failed fertilization may be modified by altering stimulational protocols, but I wouldn't say that that is absolutely a robust statement. But my argument here is that sperm dysfunction is a common finding in couples affected by failed fertilization, which I guess goes back to Professor Lewis's point right at the beginning, which is that semen analysis gives us some information, but not enough. So in real terms, then what do we do? This is a series of 20 couples affected by low or no fertilization in IVF. And those couples then move forward to ICSI, which is a logical next step. And actually you can see interestingly that two of them conceived themselves, but out of the other 18, four of them were affected by similar for poor fertilization following ICSI. So another cycle, another heartbreak, uh, another time wasted before they can get to where they're trying to get to. Similarly, if you think about a couple that have had ICSI and then experienced failed fertilization, what can we do? Well, we can repeat ICSI, but we run the risk of the same issues occurring again. You can think about using donor sperm, either a known donor or an anonymous donor, but that's a huge step and not a logical step or an appropriate step or an acceptable step for every couple involved. Thirdly then is the possibility of doing artificial oocyte activation. So this was first published as case reports back in 2010. The commonest approach by clinics uses a chemical called calcium ionophore. And the idea is that that then mimics this calcium surge that happens following uh, normal fertilization with that message from the, from the sperm. So the idea is here, if you've got a couple that have had failed fertilization, if you can identify that they have an issue with protein expression of phospholipase C zeta, then to offer them artificial oocyte activation to get past that activation step should allow them then to go forward with further treatment using the uh, uh, own eggs and own sperm. It's an interesting one because this is quite a controversial approach, not least because testing for phospholipase C zeta is not an accredited or validated uh, test as yet. And so therefore it's either a research-based test or going on the basis of this is something that's worthwhile trying without any sort of evidence um, of, of, of a test of, of, of making sure that we're ap applying this uh, treatment approach to the right couples. And perhaps then not that surprisingly, the HFEA have, have, have labeled this as an add-on and a certain amount of caution um, about how effective it might be. So the media that we use, the calcium ionophore media, it's all off the shelf media. We purchase it from a company called Gynamed and it comes in a, a vial that you just equilibrate. You do your ICSI, so you get your eggs, you inject each mature egg with the sperm. And after that, they then go into this uh, calcium ionophore media for 15 minutes, then they're washed out and then back into their normal culture conditions, which in nine wells would be into an embryoscope. 
So there are some issues, there are some concerns that people have raised with this approach, this add on to treatment, not least the issue of perhaps some cytotoxic effects by exposing the AIDS to a high amount of, of calcium ion of four or perhaps sort of epigenetic alterations or, or some sort of faults within the embryos that then create issues with the children born as a result of this technique. But reassuringly, although the numbers are small, there have been no reported increase in, in issues either on a, a developmental uh, scale, no issue in, in birth defects or in genetic um, uh, errors in, in children born following this technique. So whilst the... Um, concerns are there, I think the data to date would suggest that these are theoretical and haven't really been borne out in studies to date. So lastly then, our experience of oocyte activation at Nine Wells in Dundee. So we have had um, 38 cycles of oocyte activation that we've done for 31 couples to date. Now bear in mind, these are couples where we have identified an issue with phospholipase zeta, albeit using a research tool. And we found that we could almost normalize their fertilization following ICSI in a subsequent cycle. So 58.7% compared to 11.2% in their index treatments. And as at pre-lockdown, 15 children have been born as a result of this. So uh, about half of those couples have now got a child where they wouldn't have done otherwise. So we obviously continue to monitor this treatment add-on um, as we would be expected to. But I would say I do think that this is a genuine option and a genuine treatment for those that have been affected by fertilization abnormalities. So in conclusion, I would say that sperm dysfunction represents a significant element of apparently unexplained fertilization abnormalities. We have a significant limitation in semen analysis because it doesn't predict sperm function. In our case series, we've identified about a third of couples have an issue with phospholipase zeta deficiency and that uh, is in, in both IVF and ICSI cohorts. So it's not one versus the other that we're seeing as a, as a higher rate of, uh, or an issue. As I say, the HFEA have raised concerns and others have raised concerns regarding the safety and efficacy of oocyte activation as add-on treatment in ART. So where we stand at the moment is we have an unmet clinical need. We have a need for a validated assay to screen for phospholipase zeta to identify couples that would benefit from oocyte activation. And as Professor Lewis said, we also have a larger need to better understand how sperm function and therefore to test and understand where sperm don't function well. Thank you very much. We'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. I knew we would get some, some really good insights there and uh, this is very interesting work. And because we've had so little progress in, in this field for such a long time, it is really refreshing to see you know, a, a possible solution to many people's problems. I don't know if there are any questions. Um, if there aren't, whilst you're thinking about them, I have one. And that is, is failed fertilization a recurrent problem? So if you had one failed fertilization, does that increase your chances of another one or is it purely random? Good question. So I think overall, um, the data would suggest that if you have one episode of failed fertilization, that about 70% of couples would not experience a second subsequent failed fertilization. So there is, a, I guess, an approach that would say, just try, try again. But that would be with the kind of caveat around it, I would think as a clinician saying, well, let's change the protocol. Let's increase your stimulation. Let's aim for, for more mature eggs. You know, what other issues there are? You know, so I guess what I'm trying to present here is an overall dialogue of, of looking at the couple's response to stimulation, looking at the number of eggs, the number of mature eggs and so on, because there may be other elements that you can modify and change there. And I think at the moment that probably sits more intuitively with clinicians in the clinic than it does in terms of sort of thinking about, well, what about the sperm side of that equation and what else could we think about doing on that side? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question I suppose is, and I know, I know you don't know the answer to this, but I wonder if you can, um, expand at all. 
of failed fertilization, would you say it was 50-50 sperm egg? Would you say it was more likely to be a sperm problem than an egg problem? Does, has anybody done the research? Do, do we know? Uh, as far as I know, I don't think anyone has done that research, but I think what I would argue is that there is much more in, in there that is sperm factor than we've ever given yeah. treatment credit for. Yeah. Mm, well, like everything, like everything. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. But um, yeah, so um, I mean, I guess, you know, I've got a kind of um, a slightly, uh, what's the word, biased group of, of, of collected patients here because we've deliberately excluded those who are you know later in their 40s those who've stimulated very poorly and have not got very many eggs um you know so we've deliberately put together a cohort of couples as I say that are apparently unexplained fertilization problems yeah. with, the, with the um uh the hypothesis that this is likely to be sperm factor mm -hmm. yeah okay we have one question here, and it is in men with PLC deficiency. Do you see normal DNA fragmentation, um, which makes it difficult to identify without a validated assay? So I don't know, maybe this is something you and I should do a collaboration on. Sounds like a great collaboration, doesn't it? We haven't <laughs> done DNA damage testing per se. Um, it's certainly something that I've always wanted to um, add as a sort of another string to the, to the research bow. Um, so yeah, no, it's a it's a good question. It's a really good question, and one I don't know the answer to. No, I I don't either, and I wonder if there would be a relationship because I think you know we're terribly inclined to talk about male factor infertility as if everything to do with the male is um, all connected, and and that's totally wrong. I mean, you can have all sorts of different anomalies within sperm function. One can be that the DNA wasn't packaged properly when the sperm was being produced. Another one could be that you've got a deficiency of this protein. Um, here's another question. Can DNA fragmentation cause low fertilization? For sure. For sure. Yep. Yeah. We're agreed I agree on that one. <laughs> and I don't really know the answer to how that happens, to be honest. I find it quite baffling because if the DNA of sperm is not decondensed in, until post fertilization, why does poor DNA um, have an effect on fertilization? And yet it does. We've published a number of papers showing that that is the case. And it must be something to do with what you were talking about. Not only is, is poor DNA one of the issues that sperm may have, but that may also be associated. I'm, I'm going back on what I said previously, but it could be that some of the, um, the proteins which the sperm takes into the egg on the plasma membrane are also deficient because of a reduced compaction or, or something like that. Okay, I've got another question for you. And this is about semen quality. Now, I know that human sperm is the most homogeneous of all biological fluids. You can have good sperm, you can have bad sperm. But in IVF, if you have total fertilization failure, does that mean that all sperm that you have put in to inseminate the egg are bad? Not one single one was able to fertilize it. So, yeah, great question. I've uh, got to really get my brain thinking on that one. So, I mean, if you think about a clinic sample, so the guy produces it fresh in clinic, usually on the day of the egg collection, that sperm sample is then processed pretty promptly. Um, and it's processed usually by density gradient centrifugation, certainly in our clinic. Yes. So, you know, immediately there's a, you know, a, a difference to what happens in vitro compared to what might happen for natural conception in the sense that you know sperm aren't normally centrifuged at you know a few hundred g for 20 minutes and then moved across and so on but the idea is that we're trying to out of this uh, kind of very mixed bag of, of, of sperm ejaculated that we're trying to pick the best sperm to put with the egg that's how i would say it's my patients so you know so Pair this fraction, got this pellet of you know highly motile, really good looking sperm that are then going to be, be inseminated with the eggs. Now, usually we would then do a sort of uh, insemination of groups of eggs. So we'd have sort of up to six eggs in a dish and we would add up to 150,000 sperm per, um, per, per well. So, you know, you're already looking at, you know, over, you know one to 200,000 sperm uh, exposed. And, you know, if none of them fertilize, up to any of those eggs, then you know you're thinking surely there is an issue with the entire population there rather than one or two. 
mm-hmm. or the majority of them. But, you know, I think IVF, although it's extraordinarily medicalized, there's still a you know, huge amount of natural obstacles for the before the, the sperm can get to the egg. So around the egg is the you know, compacted uh, cumulus cells, you know, the, the hyaluronic uh, matrix and so on. Then there's the zona pellucida that they've got to get through. They've got to fuse with the egg um, membrane itself and so on. So it, it's difficult to know at what stage of that process of all of those you know, biological steps that need to happen where where things fail but I I suspect because interestingly out of the couples that have IVF failed for that we've put into our case series most of them are unexplained which makes me think actually you know it may well be that there's been this issue which has stopped you getting pregnant yourselves it's it's stopping you know the eggs being fertilized you know in, in this extraordinary medicalized environment So I suspect, you know, certainly the, you know, when you look at a proportion of sperm cells, if you look at, as you say, 100,000 or whatever sperm cells, you will see a a variety of of different things that that each of them will respond differently in terms of their calcium signals and so on. But actually, you know, whatever they need to do to to get to that point of fertilization, apparently none of that population can. Um, Yeah, okay. Um, another question here is that you, you talked about um, semen analysis not um, giving you any indication of sperm function. So this um, listener is asking, what is the sperm function test that you would recommend for total fertilization failure or low fertilization? So w- we've put together a, basically a panel of different tests. And, and, and what we do is we look at sperm motility, but we use a computer system to do that. So we get much more uh, involved information about motility, but the type of how the sperm is swimming and the type of particularly hyperactivated motility. So they, um, these computer programs can m- men- measure or monitor the sperm head moving the you know the the lateral head movement so i think that's quite an important tool we also do something called a, a penetration test where we use a, an artificial uh, solution we, we actually use wallpaper paste but it's a one percent methyl cellulose um uh, put into a little cap- capillary tube but the idea is this matches the viscosity of this you know cumulus matrix around the egg to see can the sperm penetrate into that because if a sperm can't penetrate into to the wallpaper paste then it's not going to be able to get through the cumulus cells to, to be able to fertilize the egg now those two kind of uh, quite practical uh, measurements of, of how a sperm is working come under the umbrella of sperm function. Onwards from that, we would then look at the electrophysiology. So this is measuring the electrical currents of calcium, hydrogen, potassium, um, and they are. Uh, and then we also add um, progesterone to sperm and we label calcium uh, molecules with a fluorescence and we measure the fluorescence of that. So. That's um, th- that kind of panel of, of different tests, as well as the phospholipase C to test. And I think what we what I've tried to present as a bit of a kind of whirlwind sort of tour of, of, of what we've found in this group of patients so far is that there are different pathologies that affect different couples. So some couples will be affected by a problem with the calcium because of the iron channel problems. Some couples will be affected by fertilization because of oocyte activation and PLC Z to problems. So I think a combination of looking at calcium and potassium channels perhaps and, and looking at phospholipase Z are the two tools tools that we've had the most experience with that seem to be able to give us the most predictive value. I love the idea though of adding DNA damage and I'm not going to let that one go so I shall uh, <laughs> yeah, revisit. Well, here, here's, here's another question you're going to love. Um, how do you see the future of, u- of using PLG Zeta as an oocyte activator in addition to calcium ionophores? Yeah, so there's been quite a lot of work done looking at human recombinant PLC Zeta, so, a, you know, a protein that's manufactured. And the idea there would be, well, let's just do ICSI. We put a bit of this PLC Zeta in at the same time that we inject the sperm and it gives the egg that activation uh, message that it needs. Um, and actually, you know, whilst that sounds like a phenomenal, great thing to do and you can do it on mouse eggs very, very well, it doesn't, we haven't made a recombinant a, a PLC Zeta that works in humans. So none of the um, methodology has, has been demonstrated to work in humans. I mean, I think that would be so neat to just mm-hmm. actually 
replace the protein message that needs to happen rather than bathing the eggs in extra calcium and all the rest, which is the only yeah. And I, I think that would be wonderful too, because um, I've always had a, a fear about using calcium ion before because calcium is a second messenger for so many different mechanisms within any cell. And the idea of firing a load of calcium into the egg would just worry me in terms of what else it might turn off or turn on, you know, uh, inadvertently. Now, I'm very glad to see that, you know, there are a number of children born without any problems and that um, puts my, uh, my fears to, to, to rest. I hear we have some more. Um, what other methods are available for um, AOA other than calcium ion, of course? Uh, are there any other oocyte activators? Oh, well, there's heaps. Um, so other ones that uh, you, you can activate an egg mechanically. So uh, changing its osmotic pressure, you can activate it electrically. So putting electrical plates and, 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 and aligning a, a current across those plates with the egg in the middle of it. You can activate eggs using a variety of other chemicals, including um, alcohol, so ethanol, um, Strontium is another one that's used and has been used reasonably. Uh, is, strontium is very much better in uh, mouse eggs. It actually induces the oscillations, but it doesn't in, in human eggs. Um, but it is that if you were doing, um, uh, what's the thing, Nu nuclear transfer, uh, cloning kind of stuff, then, then strontium is the go-to. I think the reality is in a clinical setting is that calcium ionophore is the one that we would most commonly use, as I say, because it is a media that you can buy pre-made with some degree of, of quality assurance. And uh, you know, it's not CE marked, but it's got a, um, you know, it's not up to the guys in the lab to sort of concoct something up that's that's going to work. So it's the only one that you can buy commercially is the calcium ionophore. But yes, there are a number of other different methods of, of activating eggs. Great. Well, we've we've come to the end of our time and we've come to the end of our questions. And I would really like to thank Sarah particularly because you and the audience don't know that Sarah's actually on holiday. She's on leave and she is such a dedicated professional that she is here talking to us. So we are most appreciative of your time and of your expertise and for telling us things tonight that we didn't know before. So that's 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 great. And I'll I'll hand back now to, to Eileen. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks again, Sarah, for, for joining us. Um, it was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, just for those of you as well, thank you everyone who, who also joined us this evening. Um, and just a reminder, ensure you sign up for the next events in the series. So we have two, two um, additional plans uh, for the webinars. Um, next month we'll be joined by um, an earlier webinar at 10 a.m. Um, we'll be joined by Distinguished Laureate Professor of Biological Sciences University of Newcastle, New South Wales, Professor John Aitken, who will be asking, should we be measuring DNA damage in human spermatosa? And then on Tuesday, the 3rd, 3rd of August, back at the normal time of 6 p.m., we will be joined by Dr. Jonathan Ramsey, consultant neurologist, Hammersmith Hospital, Imperial College, the Lister Fertility Clinic London, the Beaconsfield Fertility Clinic, and the Agora Fertility Clinic. Um, and Dr. Ramsey will be discussing the ideal urological workup for males experience in infertility. So if you haven't already registered for those events, you can do so on the events page on our website. Um, so once just leaves me to say once again, thank you for joining us. Um, you, please do get in touch if you want any more information from examine on the tests or about the webinar events. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on the 6th of July. So thanks all and have, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>